Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, many sales reps and sales leaders really place an importance on closing. And there's classic movies such as Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, where it's, you know, always be closing ABC and coffee is for closers. And where I would challenge this is if you can't open, you really don't have anything to close. So this brings me to the topic of today is discovery. And I'm delighted to welcome Dave Kennett to the podcast, who's going to share many, many insights as it relates to the discovery phase from preparation, building trust the importance of a framework, what some of the best are doing, and where we can learn from others. Just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, replays coaches listen to gong and chorus calls and provide live and recorded play-by-play -play feedback of your sales call to really drive improvements performance. So Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Karen. Great to be here. Awesome. Well, listen, I think, you know, in my opinion, you either win or lose in the discovery phase. So I'm really, obviously what you see is uh, hundreds, hundreds and thousands perhaps of discovery calls. So the insights you're going to share is going to be very beneficial to our audience uh, today. So why don't we start a little bit, just give us a little bit of background on replays and perhaps, you know, why the focus in, in this kind of discovery demo phase, where, where did that come from? Yeah, well, the background in replays is sales leaders of high growth tech companies are, you know, really who we're working closely with to support their teams. And what we find they need is A, uh, they need to free up their time. They wanna do call reviews and they know they should do call reviews. They know the benefit of it in terms of uh, improving uh, their sales team, but they don't have time or they might not have the expertise, right? There's a lot of, and, and it's no sin to say that and admit that. There's um, such high growth going on in so many tech companies right now that people get uh, promoted quickly. There's a lot of team leads who maybe haven't called coach before, sales managers who maybe haven't called coach before. If they do, it's like, like what framework are they coaching to, right? I know when I was a first time leader, it wasn't call coaching. It was, yeah, we were driving to the site and talking uh, face to face with our customers. And later on, it was, it was inside sales. But um, when, when, um, when I would debrief, I, I didn't necessarily have a framework to coach to in the early days. And so we, we, we solve those things. We provide a framework called our replays best practices. We um, help sales reps basically improve their deal velocity. And we free up time for sales leaders. So um, that's sort of the why in terms of discovery. Uh, it's like you said in the beginning. I love that. It's like, hey, you, you, you're not going to have anything to close if you don't actually really uncover need. And, and so we see discovery as the most important aspect of the whole sales process uh, for that reason. So let me just ask you, you know, if we, if we think about our conversation and the discovery, what about that preparation? Because what, what I'm really trying to understand here is, you know, what those who are really getting game changing results and, and moving the needle and, and connecting with their prospects, what are they doing well so that we can, you know, avoid reinventing the wheel? So maybe if we start at that preparation phase, like what are they doing to prepare to really consider the other person's perspective before they even get on that call. Can you share some uh, some of what you're seeing there, Dave? Yeah, sure. I mean, if we look at the bucket of pre-call planning, I think it's first and foremost understanding, all right, who's the persona that I'm talking to? So if this is a past lead from an SPR, I'm not just looking at the call notes and talking to them and asking them a little bit more context, not 30 seconds before the call, uh, but in advance. So I'm looking at the LinkedIn of the person who... Um, I'm going to meet with or people so that I get a sense as to that that buyer persona. And, uh, you know, as we all know, as we're starting to get uh, for a rep who's been in in play for a year or two within a company, once they know the persona they're talking to, they've got a pretty good sense 
as to connecting dots as to a hypothesis of what that person's need or needs may be. And so I think coming to that call with that hypothesis, also, um, of course, doing research on the organization, if you're not familiar with it, um, and looking at things like what's new in the news, what is it they're solving for, and then doing a back check uh, within your organization, right, as to are there like customers uh, who are raving fans of the solution that we provide that we can then use as a reference. Um, social proof is so important. So, and then thinking through, okay, um, you know, what are my, dis my, my discovery questions going to be? If it's going to be more of a complex call, maybe you, maybe the CMO is the person that you're um, typically making the, the decisions. They're the economic buyer. Let's say they're on the call, but you've also got a CFO and you've got a VP sales. Well, thinking through how you're going to navigate through, you know, that um, in advance instead of just really thinking about it 30 seconds before is important. And I think the final thing I'll say there is I mentioned earlier the importance of having your discovery questions ready to go. It's funny. Um, I've definitely been guilty of this uh, and we see it a lot the, uh, of the folks we coach. The senior sellers who've been selling for years will get lazy and they won't ask a standard list of questions. And so they'll get through the call and realize, oh, I actually didn't find out some very basic info that I needed. Whereas the the reps that are are, are just coming up right now are uber prepared. They've got their, their questions written down and we don't want it to ever come across as scripted, of course, and that's not what I'm suggesting. But having a reference guide, like, okay, yeah, I, I made it through my list. Super important. Yeah, I, w I think those are all great. And I would agree with that, you know, having, you know, spent two, two decades in sales myself and, and, and training a, a number of, you know, well tenured sales reps, I do find that there is a complacency there sometimes. And, you know, this winging it, or I just know, but, you know, when you can take a step back and kind of dealing with, you know, younger generation, perhaps less experienced, but they're going in and they don't have any, you know, bad habits or things to unlearn. I feel that there, you know, there's an element there if there's higher curiosity. Um, they're really engaged and, and genuinely looking to understand what their problems are. So I think you're right there and there is an element sometimes of laziness. It's like, well, this is probably the case. And it's like, you know what, people's business have completely rotated right now. So it's probably actually not the case. I can highlight that point in a, in a quick story. There's a coach I just got off the phone with or off a Zoom call with about an hour ago. And we're coaching a bunch of reps in this organization. And within that organization, he's coaching two of them. One's senior, one's junior. And I said, hey, but we're going to be doing a, a customer executive check-in uh, this next week. Tell me where you feel this team's at. What should the training plan be for the senior person and the junior person? Uh, and this is going to sound like a made-up story in the context of the fact you just asked me this, but it, it just happened. And he said, well, the senior person... Um, it needs more coaching. Uh, there's no question. Um, and, and we really are working with them on the discovery side and they're just not getting that. The young person took every single thing I said was open to the, the coaching. This is after we've reviewed about three calls over a two month period and has taken the exact replays playbook that this coach has recommended and implemented it. And now we're just going to be doing a tune up every, you know, three or four months on a call review with that individual. So I think that just goes to say that the folks, and it doesn't matter young or old, it's, it's really how willing are you to be open to coaching and, and to the idea that, Hey, maybe I could do some, some tweaks here to make things better. Yeah. I think just that, that growth mindset of, you know, we can all get better, you know, and I think, um, Mark Roberge men mentioned it in his book that the, the number one thing is coachability. You know, if you're not coachable, you know, not a good thing. Um, so it's great to, to see that. And I think that also lends itself, Dave, to the art and science of sales. Like just having that framework and that structure. And I know you mentioned script and nobody ever wants to sound scripted. But sometimes, you know, when you're on a call and you, you get pulled a little bit offside, you, you need something to come back to. Uh, some framework that gives you that guidance. Because I think in the absence of that, you no longer have that freedom to engage and, as I say, dance in the moment. So I think that's the science part. But then the art is your ability to, you know, add your own finesse and your own style to really make it not sound scripted. There, the, there is a science and there is the art. And the science, you know, if I were to put it into words, um, for me, I would say it's, it's uh, a framework. Others call it a playbook. Right. But when I look at our customers, whether it's 
you know, uh, a vineyard where they, you know, most organizations that are at series A, series B, uh, they're really starting to segment out their sales work from transactional or merging to uh, SMB and growth to uh, enterprise and then strategic. And there's a different framework for, as, as we all know, for that uh, sort of 5,000 ACV uh, call uh, or buyer motion than a hundred thousand dollar and uh, and so I think it's important to be cognizant of the fact that that framework is what shifts and that's really where we spend a lot of work is companies are thirsty for what's the right framework for my sales motion um, and more importantly my buyers motion right how my buyers want to buy uh, and then being able to, you know, we call it playing jazz. Yeah, you got to be able to play jazz and, impro and, and improvise and, 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 and coming across scripted. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not ideal. People, you know, we talk a lot about how it comes back to we're humans selling to humans. And uh, sales reps often uh, forget the fact when they're so fixated on, oh, has my PowerPoint slide or my keynote slide four uh, got the right font and, and the right uh, style and no, right number of bullets versus how am I actually making this person feel, right? Because, you know, and am I being intentional about that? And I and, and that's why we want to stay away from scripted, but framework, yes, 100%. I love that. And I want to dive deeper into the framework, but just what you said there about the, you know, the slides. And I think we're so, when we do that, we're we're focusing on the wrong person or the wrong thing. And it's like, they don't really care about that stuff. Like they care about you, the connection, how well you're going to uh, bottom line, how you make them feel, but like the type of questions you're going to ask. And I think when you're focusing on, well, you know what, I'm all, I got, you know, 12 slides to go and I have 10 minutes. So I'm just going to ram through them. And it's like, no, like forget the slides and just read your audience again, play jazz and dance in the moment and, and feel, feel what's going on. And I think a lot of times we're too, we have a checklist. It's like, yes, we're compliant. So at the end of it, we achieved everything. But like your customers laying on the floor and their eyes are rolled back. So it's like, well, did you really achieve? So I think there's there's that engagement and just checking in and saying, is this resonating? Am I coming up for air? Am I pausing to see, you know, how often is this happening? Is this even happening? Or is this a one-way monologue? And it's like, check, done, discovery, let's go to the next one. And, and I feel and I see that that is happening quite a bit. Yeah, no, I really think it is. That monologue thing happens a lot. And one sort of mental framework or model that we encourage sales reps to think about is really throwing away the notion of a demo um, and, and think of it more as it's a conversation uh, that's supported maybe by a few slides or a demo. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I think demos are extremely important. Uh, but people tend to think of, you know, like the... Uh, I did a post on this recently, uh, like the, the, the old um, Woody dolls and Jesse dolls from the animation Toy Story, right? And they, you, you can, you know, you got the toy and you, you pull the back and, the, and then Woody just speaks. And it's almost like reps think that that's what they have to do in a demo. It's like, all right, um, I'm going to stand up there and talk and they're going to listen. And that's how a demo works. And I don't blame them for thinking that, you know, it's like, Suddenly, when we get behind um, a camera, we're doing it remotely, we feel and, and uh, suddenly when there's more than one person on the other end, it just starts to become a presentation and it doesn't need to. So we, you know, I, I was taught we were, we were doing a, a review with one of our customers earlier this morning. It's been a busy morning. Um, and uh, we're talking about the fact that, that uh, you know, one of them uses a slide for an agenda every time, uh, one of the sales reps. And, uh, you know, we were saying it's absolutely important to have a goal for the meeting and an agenda. But, you know, I, I think the overarching sort of meta point that we recommend is for view, virtual calls, really try and make it the, the same as you would think about it in, in an in-person meeting. You know, if I was going to meet you in an office, I, I wouldn't take my projector screen, put it on the wall, put an agenda on the wall and say, okay, here's what we're going to go through, right? It's just, it would feel unnatural it, it, and, and back to how we want to make the person feel. And so I, I think it's super important to uh, rely on our ability to be good two-way communicators and not just on multimedia. 
Yeah, I think that's hugely important. I think salespeople, we love to hear ourselves talk, but um, you know, active listening is is huge. And I think Gong's ratio is talk to listen 46 to 54 percent, and I don't know how many of us do it. So um, something definitely to keep in mind. Um, just want to build off the framework, Dave, and I know this is really where we're going to kind of get into the nuts and the bolts of the discovery. So can you walk us through a typical, like if you're, if you're conducting, um, you know, a, a remote discovery, a virtual discovery call, like, do you have a framework that you follow from, you know, an opening, uh, do you have an upfront contract? Like what's, what's kind of the steps or the stages that you would suggest that reps follow? Yeah, I would break it down into the beginning of call. Um, where we're talking about building rapport and agenda, then, then, then your discovery, right? And so I think beginning of the call, it's about definitely taking a minute to, to build rapport. And, you know, as you know, you're going to get, typically, if you were to take people's personalities and put them into two buckets, you've got the very uh, talkative person who is relational and really wants, not necessarily talkative, but relational. They, they want you to ask about their weekend. They want to talk about their family and what they got up to. And then you've got the driver type A personality. And and it, uh, the, the, the and this is where the uh, science and the art intersect, where a rep needs to have the situational awareness of what what's going on there in that call and who's who. And if it's someone who wants to talk about their weekend, you can't just jump right into business. And if it's someone who... Uh, just wants to get down to business, you don't keep asking them about their family and, oh, I've been to your city too and blah, blah, blah. It's like, just be right, be quick and get out, right? So uh, it starts there uh, because how you start is often how you finish. So you want to set the, the right impression. Uh, all of those things we all heard growing up about you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. It's still true. Uh, and it's true in remote calls. And then setting an agenda, uh, sort of a roadmap and checking in with them, uh, making sure that Hey, are we on the same page here in terms of what we want to um, want to follow? Because it's it's not just your time as a seller; it's their time, and uh, time is our most, I believe, uh, precious commodity. And we want to be respectful of that and drive value. And then the um, the next thing is um, definitely, yeah, setting a a goal for the call and the idea of a, a sort of a, a mutual agreement or um, having a mutual contract. Uh, yeah, I think it's fine, um, and and I think it's you know. Uh, something to the effect of, hey, zero pressure here um, to, to, to buy. This may or may not be a fit for you. Um, but what we intend here is to use this time to, for me to understand a little bit more about your needs and where you're at. And if I do see what I would see as a fit here, and if you're seeing it as well, and I'd love to show you a little bit about what we do, right? And and then I think it's about um, diving into that that discovery at that point. So that would be my prelude. Framework-wise, that'd be my prelude to the discovery. Just as you were sharing that, Dave, what I really noticed was your tone and it was very conversational. So even when you were delivering that, you know, typically this is what, where we see the next steps and it may or may not be a good fit. It was very non-threatening. And I think, you know, if said uh, in, the, in a different tone, it would come across people's backs would get up and they say, you know, this isn't us. We're not prepared for this. You know, this is uh, too aggressive. And so I think tone is so important. And just what, how you delivered that was was beautiful in terms of just a very conversational tone. It puts people at ease. You're not threatening. You're not making them feel like, you know, this is a huge decision and, you know, the risk is high. It's just a conversation. Yeah, I think that's important, isn't it? Just to disarm them. And, and tone has a lot. It's not just our words. It's our tone uh, for sure. And, um, and I particularly, I can be a bit of an exuberant, overwhelming personality, and I've had to really learn where and when to dial that back. And I, uh, I forget sometimes still, uh, for sure, but it, it is that, that level of self-awareness, whereas others tend to be uh, too much of a church mouse and, uh, and aren't letting their, it, it could be mistaken for lack of enthusiasm about what they're selling and people want to know that you value what you're selling. And what's funny about that is people often say, well, you're asking me to change my personality, right? If we're talking, if we're coaching someone who's uh, an introvert and there's so many awesome introverted salespeople, it's such a misnomer that introverts can't be great salespeople. And I think it's getting more and more widely known that most, uh, there's a lot, some of the best salespeople are introverts. A lot of them are. Um, but that uh, we're not asking anyone to change their personality. We're asking them to do is adapt their style to the personality of the person they're selling to and how their message is going to be best received. 
That's what we're asking you to do. Uh, not change yourself as a person, <laughs> uh, but but to just change your, your style. And I think a, a, a case in point is the example we used a minute ago as to how you open a call. You're either you're going to judge very quickly whether you go to the next, if they're a direct driver, you go to the next uh, business item. And if they're more relational, you spend a bit more time. Mm-hmm. And and think about, you know, the service you provide in terms of, you know, virtual coaching and to really drive that awareness. A lot of people may be unaware that they are, you know, perhaps um, interrupting their customer or their energy is low and, and the impact it's having on their customer. But if they don't see that video or because in a face to face meeting, there's no replay button. Right. So th- think of the awareness that you're coaching and just that the rep can have in watching that and going, wow, I didn't actually know when I was silent. They may have perceived that as lack of passion, lack of belief and conviction in my product when I'm just nervous because slide 14, I'm not too sure on or whatever it is. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or your natural preference is just to be a little bit more laid back and subdued, uh, but that might not resonate. So you might have to amp up the enthusiasm level uh, just a little. Yeah. I, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, confidence is really, you know, doing something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable every day. And whether if you're an extrovert and that forces you to come down a little bit and, you know, be quieter and more others focused, or on the flip side, you know, amp up the energies, you said, you know, you have to do it to really put your customer at ease. And, and like you said, disarm them. I think that's the biggest thing that we have to do as salespeople now in order to, you know, facilitate a buying decision. We need to disarm them. I think the first thing is going back to my point earlier of to not think of your discussion as I'm going in to do a presentation, but I'm going in to have a conversation and it may be supported by a demo or a presentation. And I, I think, you know, a lot of sales leaders will measure a good demo by whether it's the same demo that they taught in the onboarding a year and a half ago. And uh, we feel at Replays that uh, the best demo is the demo that speaks to that specific prospect's needs. And a a demo should look different almost every single time. And it should look different because of the discovery that's done up front, right? And so if I'm chatting with you uh, through my discovery and you're telling me after a 10, 15 minute discovery that um, A and B is really important to you, but C isn't, then I should be spending 80% of my time when we get to the demo on A and B, not C. And the person I'm talking to right after you in my discovery might say C is more important to them. Well, then I should spend 80% of my time on C. And, and again, if you've got a, a, a sales leader that's reviewing those calls and they're like, wait, that's not what we taught you in your onboarding. We taught you to spend 30% of your time on A, 30% on B and 30% on C. Uh, that, that's just, you know, the rep that does the accurate discovery and then tailors their presentation to the specific uh, person is going to, a person's needs is going to win, right? They're going to win that deal. The more clear you are in the discovery, the more tailored the demo. And I just find a lot of people, you know, in preparation for the demo, I'll coach them and say, okay, so where do they really want to focus? Like, what are the three areas you're going to talk about? And they're like, well, this is kind of a problem. I'm like, well, like, what's kind of is how often is it? Is it occurring? How how much is that costing them? Like, what's the impact? And it's just like, so I think when you ask these questions, it's like, instead of going on your 10 questions and stick to three. And if they're on a, you know, on a thread with that third one, go deep and get like, get, get to the root of it. And the biggest area that I see is the impact because the problem is one thing. What's the, the impact to, you know, financially, culturally, environment, all these things that it's like, when you bring that back to the demo, you know, Dave, this is what we, we talked about and bring it right back to that person who shared that with you, you know, because all of a sudden that's a lock and key fit. And I just feel that people are so um, focused on just any question and it's like there's you have to be strategic in your questions and then you have to anchor it back in the demo so I think what you say is 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 bang on my question is just like why do you think people aren't doing that Uh, we find that there's a few key reasons one um, and I'm sure you see this as well uh, reps are um, often thinking that they're going to put their customers out when they're having these conversations, that they're, they're when they go too far into discovery, they feel like they, they're putting them on the act, 
you know, inquisition stand or that the, the prospect will feel like they're asking 20 questions uh, or playing the, like playing the 20 questions game. And, and, uh, and I understand that for sure. Um, but if the prospect's feeling that way, then the rep's doing it wrong, right? And, and the, the reason I say that is uh, there's ways to make discovery conversational and there's ways to make it a give and take and there's ways to manage expectations. So I think that's one bucket of why discovery is not done well. The second bucket we see is people are like, no, no, far better if I actually just do discovery while I'm doing my demo. Here's the feature. Let me ask you questions on how you would use that feature. Um, here's the benefit. Go to the next one. And I think the challenge there is if we use the sort of example we used earlier of, hey, if we're looking to uncover whether A, B, or C is a pain point for you, um, then we might, it's far better if we find that out early so we can customize our presentation. That's in the best interest of the customer. So what we really work with reps on is helping them understand that by asking questions, you're actually making the best use of your prospect's time. You're actually got their best interest in mind because you're trying to tailor a solution for them. And then we work with them on their level of confidence in doing that through muscle memory, through role plays and that kind of thing. And through specifically working on being more conversational, incorporating customer stories, making it more of a give and take so that it doesn't feel as a prospect, like I'm on the inquisition stand. Mm -hmm. And when you say give and take, are you, are you, can you give us an example of what a give and take would, would sound like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and just to sort of bring it up a level first, it's like, we want the North star to be, if, if, if you're, you know, if I'm a sales leader and I'm talking to my sales team, I'd be saying, try and strive, aspire to have every single presentation slash discovery, um, have the prospect leave there feeling like, wow, I learned a lot. And like, I learned so much that I actually would have paid for that call. Now, if you were to go back and look at my discoveries in the last year, would every customer or prospect have said that? No. Um, but do I aspire to that every time? Yes. And do some of them maybe say, oh, wow, I actually did learn a lot. Yeah. A few, well, I know a few did. It's funny. A few people didn't move forward with replays, but ping me later going, hey, I actually tried those two things you said with my sales team and they are crushing it. I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad I could help. <laughs> you should try the other 98 best practices we recommended. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, uh, and so um, in, terms of, um, in terms of how that sounds, it, it, it would be, uh, and what we mean by give and take is um, you can use industry statistics uh, or internal benchmarks or customer stories to educate. So if you were to say to me, Dave, I, uh, you know, I ask you, uh, and let's say you're the, you're the VP sales and I'm selling something within the tech stack for, for sales folks. And I'm like, you know, love to understand um, what your uh, win rate has been looking like this last quarter. Um, and you share that with me and it's lower than expected and there's higher expectations for future quarters and you're concerned about that and stressed out about it, I might then say, well, um, here's how I would use um, customer benchmarks um, and industry statistics. I might say, well, I, I know that you're just post series A and you know if you look at the statistics, um, the ramp rate for a series A organization of your size at this stage typically is X. And so it's not unusual, uh, but the top 10% are at Y. And some of those are our customers. I'd love to share a couple of customer stories on, on actually how we help them get there. And internally, we've actually got 20% of our customers were at series A in the last year. And um, when they started with us, their win rate was X. And now it's grown by uh, 8%. It's X plus 8%. But I'd love to share with you, you know, how we did that. Like, I don't want you to just hear it from me. I want you to hear the customer's experience. So it would be helpful if I walked you through a couple of customer stories there. That, that's how I would position something. Like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're giving insights to, and then you can share the results you were able to get as a, because of that. And it sounds like you did a bit of a before and after where you're painting a picture where they can see themselves in that before. Well, that's right. And, you know, it, it is because I think a lot of reps think, okay, well, now I'm going to launch into my presentation. But it's like, hey, after I've shared these industry stats with you, our internal benchmarks and these customer stories, 
Now I'm going to continue on my questioning, but I also want to manage your expectations around it saying, Hey, I apologize if it feels like I'm asking you a million questions here, but trust me, I'm really doing this to, uh, cause I don't want you to see and waste your time with our standard pitch. Like that's the last thing I want to do. I want to know what matters to you so that we just show you at the end of this, what I think is going to be the most impactful for you. So if it's okay with you, I've just got five more minutes of questions. So that's another t strategic sort of phraseology that we recommend uh, within the discovery to help get the person's buy-in. You demonstrate the value as to why you're, you're asking those, those questions. And I think that's so, that's just building, con sharing context. And I think that's so often missed. And, and, and I think when it's done, it just allows you again to disarm and let them know where is this question coming from? Like the reason I'm asking this is because typically what we see is buyers in, in similar phases for you. And it's just like, oh, okay. Otherwise it's like, why the hell did you just ask me what I'm, you know, what, 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 what I can, perhaps they perceive as a personal question. It's like, actually, no, it had, <laughs> there is meaning behind it. But in absence of that, and even in coaching, when, you know, and a lot of people, when I, when I review coaching calls, and they'll just start off right away into, you know, the, the um, you know, the, uh, what they're seeing. And I just said, why don't you start with the why? Like the reason I'm, we're having this coaching call is because my, my objective and how I measured and what my focus is, is to develop you as a salesperson in order to do that and help you improve and build confidence. This is why, and just give them the why, otherwise they're feeling attacked, micromanaged. Why are we going through this? So I think context, whether it's, you know, internally or externally is huge. Yes, it is. That context is huge. And as you say, especially if you're asking what could be considered more private questions, right? Around, hey, what were your metrics last quarter? What was your win rate? How is your team tracking versus target? What is your target next quarter? I would definitely be giving context around, hey, one of the things we're going to do is really help um, the typical outcome working with customers is helping your win rate improve, your sales cycle time reduce, as well as average order size go up. And uh, just to really help get a sense as to allay the land in your scenario, can I ask you a few questions around that, right? Then it's like, ah, okay. And they may say no, but more often than not, they say yes. And they, they feel a little bit disarmed because they've connected, you've helped them connect dots as to why you're asking questions. So no, I think that's great. And another thing you, you mentioned earlier is that the impact, right? Which is huge. So really where we see a lot of reps falling short is they'll ask a question, they'll have it written down here, and they'll ask it because it was written down here. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I just need to check a box and I need to write an answer. And so I might be like, you know, love to understand um, why it is that you're making, uh, why it is you reached out. Uh, well, we reached out because we are, we have a lot of financial pressure uh, this coming year. And our CEO said that we need to find a better tool for blah. Um, and then it's like, okay, thanks. And the next question, as opposed to are they the obvious, which is, you know, this, you see this all the time, right? Like you know, 80% of sales reps, probably if I had to guess, uh, or maybe 60%, we'll just move on to the next question. Like it's a checklist. Like it's, you know, one of those little forms you fill out before you go into the, a new dentist office or something as opposed to, okay. Um, interesting. You, you, you just mentioned that there's a real drive for, um, you know, improvement, help me understand, um, you know, how that's, you know, I'd love to learn more context around that. And then the open ended questions around it, when really you want to get down to what's the impact of making a decision or not making a decision to move forward. So status quo, what they have now versus something else and then, and then quantify it, right. You know, what is the cost of not doing business with us? There's a cost. And, um, when a person doesn't navigate through discovery effectively and they get to the end of their call and they say, so what did you think? And the person goes, meh, I don't know. Well, if you didn't do a good discovery, you're like, yeah, but people really like it. Like you should buy it. Like, you know, let's why not, you know, as opposed to, but you mentioned earlier on that you've got a director from your CEO to absolutely crush Q2, Q3 and Q4 this year. You feel like you're not enabled, your team's not enabled to do that from this perspective because you don't have blah, uh, if, if, I respect the fact that you're feeling like maybe we're not the right solution, but can I ask why that is? And also, if you don't go with us, what, what is your plan? Uh, respectfully asking it, of course. You know, so, you know, 
as you said earlier on, uh, you can't actually unlock something unless you have the right key and you can't have the right key unless you ask the right question. So I, I love that analogy. You, but you know what, that when you just as you were asking those questions, Dave, for, for me, that was confidence. And I would say that, you know, some of these junior reps may be intimidated by um, those types of questions. I think they're amazing. I think when you recap and you tie it back to the initial problem, the reason why they called you in the first place uh, is exactly reminding them why they called you. Because so often I, I hear, does it make sense? Uh, if I could just erase that question, it's not even a question. Does it make sense? Or what do you think? And I just think if your goal is to understand, am I getting closer to the end result or further away? Does it make sense? Doesn't give me any indication. So like asking those kinds of questions and, and the biggest one I think is what is the risk of doing nothing? Like if you just stay the same as you are today, what is the risk? And, and, and I think, you know, when you don't ask that question, the risk might be huge. It might be like, you know what, we actually have to lay off or we lose budget. Or it could be, you know, nothing really. We just business as usual. But if you don't have that, you really have no understanding of their motivation. And that's when ghosting happens. So I yeah. think, you know, our job also is a transfer. They're buying our confidence. And when you can have those questions that are pointed, that are still diplomatic and professional, you're going to get an answer. And I just, I would rather have a no than a waiting in limbo and checking in and touching base that people are doing forever and ever. Like if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose quick and move on. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, I, I, the confidence piece is such a big part of it. And, um, you know, people, we, we know that we don't grow unless we take risks. And what we do at Replay is we help reps to understand which risks to take, where they're educated risks, because we reviewed uh, thousands of other calls of reps and we have access to the win rate data. We know what works. And I know you do that with your, with your customers as well. And I think the, um, you know, we look at, at confidence uh, from really three different perspectives. Uh, have they got the expertise, right? Have they got the experience and have they, have they got the preparation, right? If you're lacking any of those three things, it's going to be a hit to your confidence. And so the, the preparation, how can you boost your confidence? Pre-call plan very, very well, like we talked about earlier. Um, expertise, have you studied up to really make sure that you've got the level of subject matter expertise in the pain that you're solving and they're, you're, you're really your buyer persona and their life and how you can make that better? Um, and then, you know, in terms of the actual experience, hey, that just comes in time. Um, but if you have the other two, um, you know, getting some mileage behind you is just going to make you better. And uh, like anything, you got to get some more wounds before you improve. But uh, we see reps going out. It's like me with my golf game. I've been going to the driving range for years, but I've been practicing, you know, my slice. I've just been making my slice, my bad shot better. Um, right. And it's like, you know, we, we I, for anyone who's listening, uh, who watched the PGA Championship this weekend, Phil Mickelson, oldest uh, major winner in history, you know, he's one of the best in, ever in, in, in the art of the flop, sh flop shot. And, you know, if they're sitting there telling us, uh, you know, you see how Phil Mickelson does that flop shot and how he opens up um, his stance and he opens up the face and he, he has a, a weaker grip or whatever it is. Uh, those three things could be wrong, by the way. I'm no specialist in this. Um, but a rep might hear that and they might try that. Um, but if Phil Mickelson actually followed them around the golf course, uh, for a day, he'd leave with them with some pretty cool stuff. And I, and, and that's what our replays coaches, uh, I know, and, and I know that's what you do as well is do right. Is helping drive muscle memory through actually, uh, following them around the golf course, or in this case, listening to discoveries and demos and, and meeting them where they're at and, and giving them, them tips. I think that's great and, and very valuable because, you know, role playing is so key and, um, and, and even that coaching, because like you said, I can hear what you say and it makes sense, but then I'm going to go out and practice it on my customers. Right. And as you said, we get one chance to make a first impression. And I just think it takes, you know, whether you're a sales leader or you, you know, you consult with replays, like you don't know what you don't know. So the longer you continue to practice and you're, you know, you're improving <laughs> your bad stroke, like at some point you need these lines are never going to cross. You need some, you know, professional guidance, best practices to say, this is what you need to do. And I think those who 
um, maybe lack confidence, I can see those are three great things, experience, expertise, and preparation, because think about when you're nervous. It's because you're not prepared, yeah. right? And you know that. A lot of even if you're doing a presentation or a keynote, I usually get really excited because I've done the work in advance and I'm ready to deliver and I'm thinking about the way I'm going to make the audience feel. I'm not thinking about me, but I've put in the work, like you've put in the reps. And I just think that's what the salespeople have to do because the prospects buying their confidence. And if you're going in there and you're shaky and you're wavering and in your head, you're, you know, your negative talk, you're projecting that to the customer and they're not interested. They're looking for a trusted advisor, somebody who can take them along a journey and co-create that future state. And if you're leading with that, you're not the one for them. Yeah, uh, well said. I could not agree, could not agree more. And, you know, reps can um, de-risk any call by preparing more and, and, de- and, and bolster the chance of them feeling more confident. And so that's completely in their hands uh, to do that. I, I also think it, you know, I, and instead of an actual, like, you know, sharing an actual framework, because, you know, this could really vary slightly depending on whether you're doing um, a strategic deal that's worth a million dollars. Like we work with coaching IBM and the deal size 50 million to 150 million. And then we'll work with high growth tech companies where the average deal size is three to six K. And, and so there are some commonalities. What I've tried to share is the commonalities, right? In terms of pretty much all those things we just talked about apply, whether you're doing a five minute discovery or a four call discovery with different stakeholders. Um, And I think what I would uh, really zero in on is um, number one, the preparation. Number two, preparing customer stories that you can weave in and just basically saying to everyone, it's okay to actually share a customer story throughout your discovery. And then really diving deep uh, once you've hit a vein, so to speak, right? Really understanding what the pain is and and the impact of the pain. Um, And then, um, you know, I think the the question is, we get this question a lot. When have you done enough discovery? When's the time to move on? (laughs) And um, I think the time to move on is when you're almost jumping out of your boots going, okay, wow, I can really help this person. I understand how I can help this person. I understand what the financial impact's gonna be. Uh, And and you also understanding where they're at in terms of their buying process. A lot of people leave that to the end of the call and you can do that. But uh, I think it's good to bring that up and qualify in the discovery. Like, hey, just so you know, um, know, and, and it's okay to, you know, I'll, if I'm skeptical as to whether someone can afford replays, because we're not the cheapest, um, I'll say, hey, just want you to know up front, this is kind of the range that we're at. Like, I own it, right? I own the fact that we're, we're not the cheapest. But the freaking every single one of our customers will stand up and tell you the ROI they got out of it. So there's, you know, that's powerful, right? Um, it's powerful for a- any organization w- that will get their customers to advocate for them. But I, I, what I wanted to also do is talk about, you know, how this framework varies, uh, whether it's an inbound generated lead or an outbound generated lead, right? Because an inbound generated lead, um, the science is different, the framework's different than outbound. And, you know, these pre- people already reached out for a reason. They were interested for a reason. Uh, there was something that compelled them to fill out a form or take an action to learn more. Whereas if we reached out to them uh, and our first question is, so what pain points you got? Like you called me, what are you talking about pain points? I don't know what you do. Right. And so it's super important. I think to that's where the pre-call planning part of your hypothesis of their need is super important. So my framework there would be after we build rapport, after we set, you know, set the agenda and agree on that. And we sort of agree on the, the goal of the call is to, uh, throw out a couple buckets, right? And say, typically, you know, we reached out to you and, and typically what we found when we're talking to vice presidents of finance, like yourself in, in this industry, because we've got a lot of folks in your industry that are customers, uh, there's uh, two or three things, main things that really keep them up at night that we're solving for. Uh, it's okay with you. I just want to share those buckets with you. And, and, and can you just tell me like maybe out of 10, 
how much is each one like driving you nuts? Um, you know, 10 being it's driving me nuts. One, it's like, no, we got it covered. Uh, here are the three buckets. Boom, boom, boom. And, and the prospect, what you'll find out there very quickly is the prospect will say, uh, bucket A, I'm fine. Bucket B, yeah, maybe seven out of 10 in pain. Bucket C, oh yeah, no, that, that drives me nuts. Okay. Well, good news is we solve for that. But can I ask you a few questions first about that? And then that's how you can kind of ease into a discovery when someone uh, showed up not really knowing why they're there. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Well, just getting that resonance. And um, I think their studies show that if you were just to give them one and it doesn't resonate, you know, you're kind of out. But even when there's three, they're one that might not be, but they'll, they'll go for one of them because there's a proximity, right? They'll take it. Yeah. But, but so often, Dave, people just, and especially when they're outbound, like you have to sell the problem, right? And they jump to the pitch. And like you said, the customer's like, I don't even know who you are or what you do. Why are you pitching for me? Like, we, is there a good fit? And I just think there's that. It's those folks that continue to give sales, unfortunately, a bad name. Yeah, that's right. And you know what? Innocently enough, right? They, they were never coached on the difference between an inbound or an outbound lead. And, and so uh, God love them, right? I'm sure I was that person at one point in my career. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's why you and I do what we do is to, uh, help, help give those people a fighting chance against their competitor who are a little bit more educated on the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're coming to the end of the discovery now, and you're looking to kind of lock it up and really maintain that momentum, so you're advancing it, what are some things that we should be doing? Yeah, I, I think it, you know, what I typically say is okay, thank you for bearing with me uh, through all those questions. I really appreciate it. That really is helpful in giving me context and actually making this next part of our discussion a lot more impactful. So um, what I wanna do now, and then you almost do a mini agenda of your next 20 minutes or next half hour or next 10 minutes. You know, what I wanna do now is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna give you the standard pitch. I just, who, who likes sitting through a pitch? In fact, I just like it to be a conversation. So, you know, I asked you if A, B or C, you know, is driving you nuts. It sounds like C really is. And it sounds like it's costing you this right now. And if you don't do something about it, this is what it's actually going to, how it's going to impact your business. So I, great news. I really I know we can help you there. And I'm going to share with you how we've helped some other customers there, but I'm also going to show you uh, just a little bit of how, uh, does that sound good? Right. And then, so you're kind of doing a recheck in and then, and asking for permission and then off you go, right, in your demo. And then it's still important to make that conversational and check in, you know, every minute and a half to two minutes and uh, without saying thoughtless things like, like, as you pointed out earlier, so many people say, make sense or any questions. Super important to do meaningful check-ins. Uh, so that's how I would transition. There's a million different ways to transition, but that's one way I would transition from my discovery into the uh, show and tell part of the discussion. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, conversational tone, Dave, and you just made it very logical, sequential next steps, but it's based on what they shared with you. And I think when people don't get that, those nuggets that they've just told them, they don't have that, that eloquence, right? And it's like, so what do you think? Like you just said, do you like my product? Do you want to buy my product? And the answer is you no. Know, I, I, that's right. And that was me a long time ago, right? It's, it's that mileage piece. And you know, thankfully, sales trainers are there and great coaches and great leaders are there to help you leapfrog in those areas. But I remember pitching um, Microsoft a long, long time ago. I think I was one year out of university and went down to Redmond and was at their head office. And I was uh, in there with my boss, who's the COO. And it was the dot com boom days. Right. And and I had uh, not earned my title or earned my role, but I was put in it because it was a high growth tech company. And they're like, Hey, let's throw you in there. And I'm very thankful that they did. Uh, I learned a lot. I remember just being scared, scared, scared about how I was going to navigate through this call. And I remember my voice trembling. I remember like handing a paper over and it was shaking a little bit. And uh, guess what? I had to go through that to get to where I am now. And in five years, when you and I do another podcast together, I'll say, oh man, five years ago, this, this, and this was a massive development opportunity for me. And here's how much better I am at that. We, you know, so it's, um, it's okay for people to, for us all to be where we're at. It's, uh, it's what we're doing about it that matters. Yeah, I would completely agree. And I mean, I started, I'm not like, I made all those mistakes like you as well, but the only thing for me was 
you know, after it was a mistake and I reflected on it, I just never wanted it to happen again. You know, that embarrassment or that bit of God, that was, a, that was preventable. So it was just like, it was a mistake, but it, it only becomes a mistake if you don't do something about it. So, you know, you do things once and you do th this, a different mistake once. And then, and then after a while, like as you said, you grow and you kind of learn and you learn what questions get them leaning in, uh, what questions they don't like because that's on their website. What, what are seller focused questions versus like the best one is when, you know, they, they say, Karen, I'm, I've actually never been asked that before, or that's, that's really thought provoking. That's what I want. I want to stand out and ask them something that's really going to make them think and look inward. And that's where change comes about because, you know, there's a bit of discomfort there, but it's revealing something. And then once it's revealed, it's like, well, now that we're aware of it, like we kind of can't brush it back under the rug. That's right. Yeah, totally. And I find it helpful to remind myself and to remind uh, newer reps uh, of what's at stake. Uh, we're not saving lives here. <laughs> you know, so a deal slips, right? And I don't say that lightly because as a sales leader um, who's led, you know, large high growth teams, I hated it when a deal slipped. But at the end of the day, we all have to manage our emotional mental health. And hey, no one's going to die because a freaking deal slips. Get over it. And your boss will get over it too. They'll forget about it next quarter. Life goes on. And so I think we put too much pressure on ourselves. I think we put too much pressure on our reps. And I've been guilty of that. I've been uh, very guilty of that in the past. And I've really tried to work on that. Um, that's a developed opportunity for me. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, so that's how I, that, that's the other thing that helps, helps a little bit. Yeah. That's well, Todd Capone was on a few weeks ago and he was said, celebrate the failures and just, I think destigmatize because it's not a failure. Like a lot of times there's learning in it and just, you know, what that does to the morale of the team. And even in some instances you were going to lose anyway. So, you know, um, bow out gracefully. Yeah. So listen, uh, Dave, you've shared many, many valuable and tactical insights with us from um, preparation, really that, you know, the heart of the discovery, how to be conversational. If people are thinking, you know, God, I really want to, you know, improve, but is there, and where could I start? Like, is there two or three things that I could really start today and, and focus on to really start driving results? I think preparation is number one. Uh, so de-risk it for yourself. Take that extra time. I know it sucks when you're back to back all day. You have to make, maybe spend some time the night before preparing or getting up early, but that is what it is. Just remember that your competition is doing that. And if you want to beat them, that's what you need to do. I think um, remembering that, you, you know, your, your lock and key analogy, you, you know, you can't find the right key unless uh, you understand uh, the type of lock it is. And, and I think that only comes through thoughtful questions. And being present in your discovery, not just going through a checklist, but really listening and being like, okay, um, what, like when I play 20 questions, I've got three little kids. When I, when I got uh, play 20 questions with them when we're on road trips and stuff, they don't have 10 questions already in their head. They're going to ask their next question based on what I said last time. And they're like, you know, and, and that's what we need to be doing better in these uh, sales calls. So Dave, if people are looking to learn a little bit more about replays or follow you or get in touch of, with you, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I'd love to hear from them. Uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way. Um, and um, so it's Dave Kennett, replays, uh, R-E-P-L-A-Y-Z. Uh, or hit me up at Dave at replays.com if you want to shoot me an email. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely converse with a lot of folks on LinkedIn and we, we try to provide a ton of uh, tips on there or, or checking out our, 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 our masterclass. And in fact, actually for all of your listeners, um, I'm happy to give um, a, a 50 percent discount for our replays masterclass uh, for between now and, and July 1st. But, um, and we don't take that lightly. I mean, this is the same training we've given outreach uh, and others. So um, why don't we just say that the, the, the discount code has to be Karen? Woohoo! I love it. Thank you. Well, this will all be in the show notes and there'll be a link with the discount code and uh, we'll put, uh, they have to write Karen in it. Uh, so that's, that's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you, Dave, for taking the time to really walk us through, you know, the, the importance of an effective discovery, really the conversational tone, the engagement, being others focused, having a framework 
and really disarming them. It's a conversation at the end of the day. We're not, you know, neurosurgeons. We're just trying to help them if we can. So I think you did a really great job of that. And I want to thank you uh, for sharing your expertise and your insights with us today. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. I really enjoyed our chat. This was awesome. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you. Well, for those of you who uh, listened today, if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and share. And thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time.